finished sampler that we'll be making, but it's the nature of diamond tufting or deep button tufting that you have to start with a really clear plan because all of these buttons, that pattern is mimicked through the padding and into the board or whatever substrate that you're working with. So let's put this aside and talk about where we started to get here. So let's talk about how we are going to develop the plan for our tufting. We are going to math the heck out of this project in a little bit, but that gets really tedious and time consuming. So we wanna make sure that we're actually happy with the layout we're aiming for before we do that. And my favorite way when I am approached with a new tufting project is to just play around with the space. So I have marked the center on my boards, both directions. That'll help me just kind of eyeball a space out. And then I have, there's some uncovered button molds here that I can easily move around and decide what we want to do with it. Okay, so maybe, maybe we'll do four rows and I can do three on top and four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, scooch those out, spread them out. Two, three. And one, two, three, four. So this is a very low obligation way to get a snapshot of how that space is gonna look because every, every space is a little different. So your math has to kind of flex to give you a satisfying layout. And that looks, that looks okay. It's not entirely unusual to have a different number on the top than the bottom. If we have an even number of rows, that will happen. And you see it all the time on chairs and sofas. This being a reversible kind of panel, I would love to have it symmetrical. Same number of buttons on top as on bottom. So maybe we're gonna see if we can squeeze another row in the middle here. So maybe let's go to four. Maybe let's go to a nice spread out four on top. And that would be in the middle as well. Two, three, good. And we already have four on the bottom and then we'll have rows of three in the middle. So that expands our diamond quite a lot. Now let's talk about uh, some, some general guidelines. I hesitate to say rules because as soon as we come up with a rule, everybody promptly disagrees on it. Um, and every, someone comes along and says, I'm gonna break that rule and be a rebel. So we gotta take rules with a grain of salt, but there are some guidelines, some considerations that we can keep in mind when we are deciding our layout. Now, one of them is that you won't see a lot of tufting that is square, and that is because getting a fold to hold on the true bias of the fabric, it can be a little challenging depending on that fabric. So you're far more apt to see an actual diamond, something that's taller than it is wide. Now I'll tell you, I've broken that rule and gotten away with it. So have a lot of other people, but it's definitely something to consider before you boldly promise your client crisp square tufts, okay? The other thing that I like to bear in mind is like just looking at it aesthetically for a balanced layout, having whatever, your, whatever the width of your diamond is, having about half the distance from there to the board. I think is a pretty good, pretty good uh, concept to have in mind. Obviously we can, that too, we can break it if we want, but you can see it starts to look a little odd if we're way out at the edges or if we're super far in from the edges, that it can just start to look a little unbalanced. So I like that guideline. And the other, the other rule, you know what? I wanna squeeze another row in here because, do I want to? Nope, I don't wanna squeeze another row. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna scooch these around because I feel like that is, I feel like that's a bit much. So let me, let me slide these in. I am gonna go with four, and I like the number of rows, I want four buttons, but then I wanna, I wanna pop one over in here. Yeah. And we tell you one reason why, and I think this story is a little funny, because I worked at a place early in my career where they said, you must always have a short row on top. That is the rule because it makes a better looking top corner. And I actually tend to agree. But then later in my career, I worked at another very good workroom and they said, you must always have a long row on top because it makes the 
corner work better, which I thought was very interesting that we had the exact same rules for the exact same reasons, but with completely opposite conclusions. So experiment, see what you think. This is my recommendation, but it is definitely not a an industry standard. Okay, this looks pretty good to me though. I like that. I think that's gonna give us enough rows to really get the hang of all the techniques we're introducing. So this is not perfect, but from this, I can absolutely come in and extrapolate my math. And what, what happens when I do this, this is like five and a quarter, that's four and a half, this over here is five, this is four. You start to see why we don't eyeball things because eyeballing does not give you crisp, accurate math. But what I can do is kind of split the difference of all of those and go, okay, well, you know what? The average seems like it's gonna be about, like my diamonds are gonna be about four and a half inches wide. I'm gonna scoot that in a little bit. So I'm gonna go with four and a half on the width. Let me see, yeah. Yeah, got five over here, got four and a quarter there. I'm gonna go with four and a half. I'm cheating a little bit, of course, because I know what our tufting sampler came up when we've done it in the past, but I do want to talk you through the process we used to come up with it. And then on the vertical, it's about six and a half. That's about six. So take a few, it's about six and three quarters. Yeah, that's about six and three quarters. And I have kind of liked on this. I like the six and a quarter. And that's about, that's about a proportion that I like. Like I said, I don't want to, I want, don't want to do squares. I also don't want to do spectacularly flattened out diamonds. You're going to run the, the same issue. But that ratio, somewhere in the neighborhood of that ratio, that, that works pretty well for us. So now all I have to do is get all my diamonds out of, or all my buttons out of the way. Oh, you know, and this is a great place. This is a great place to take a picture and send it to your client. Does this look right to you? Now I'm just going to remember that I have four and five and we'll be okay. Okay. So we don't want to guess at those button placements. What else can we do? We can mark out all the intersections. And our intersections now, right, they're going to be they're going to be staggered like this. But what's easiest is if we just go ahead and mark all the rows and columns. We're just going to have an easier time of picking out where we want our buttons to go. So I'm going to come out from the center. What is half of four and a half? Two and a quarter. I'm gonna go two and a quarter out. Oh, my ruler looks like it needs replacing. Those numbers are getting pretty hard to read. This might be uh, this might be my ruler's last online appearance. All right, and over here, two and a half, and two and a quarter. Excuse me, and four and a half. Beautiful. And I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna keep going all the way out to the edge of my board. And then the last one hits the edge. So we'll skip that. Two and a quarter, four and a half, six and three quarters, and nine. Line there. There we go. One of my marks was just a little bit off there. That one too. So take your time here because accuracy really matters when we are diamond tufting. Now you're going to see me mark a lot of stuff and I'm going to keep marking from the center out. It can be tempting to try and work from the edges, but we have the board, we have the foam, we have the fabric, and our most accurate course of action is always gonna to be to start back from that center so that any sort of margin of error
falls off to the edges and doesn't kind of pile up to one side. Now I'm gonna do my six and a quarter. Now I need to mark out three and one eighth inches off from the center. I rarely use eighths inches. Um, I'm a very lazy math person actually, that might surprise you, but I really am. I'm always looking for the round numbers we can use. Um, but sometimes you just gotta, you gotta go with what the project dictates. Probably I'm getting my head all up in that camera. Luckily my sad ruler, uh, the three and one eighths mark is nice and clear. Fantastic. So now we have a full grid on that board that is what? Half the distance between our diamonds. Four and a half goes to two and a quarters. Six and a quarter goes to three and an eighth. There's our center, there's our center. So now we just have to come in here and figure out which ones we wanna put diamonds on. I had four on top, so I know I'm not gonna have one in the center. So I need to put a button here, 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 and here. <clears throat> then we'll go down and we'll do the opposite. and just keep carrying our way down the board. So this takes what we sort of eyeballed and cleaned it up to a professional level of precision. And this will drive all of our subsequent layers. Okay, let's take a peek. We got four, we got five, we got four, we got five, we got four. They should all be perfectly spaced. Let me grab a tool. I'm gonna take this off camera and drill all these holes in our mess area because I don't want this all over my cutting table. We asked for a 5 16 drill bit. I think actually I'm a little bit smaller because I couldn't find my 5 16 in the move. You certainly have a little bit of a range, but we want enough that we can get a button needle through there comfortably without having to fish around all day to find the holes. So I'm gonna come back. back with all of my button holes drilled out. We are set with our board and we're ready to talk about foam. So we are using a two inch foam today. That's really, I would say, a functional minimum for a deep button tufting. If you get less than that, you can certainly put buttons in, but it's very challenging to get it to hold a fold. So I have a two inch uh, foam. I like something kind of firm for tufting. I think it holds the diamonds better, uh, but you can experiment with that. And my foam is cut a full inch bigger than the board or a half inch on each side. So that's what I have going on here. And now of course, we need that same pattern transferred over to our foam. Now a lot of times students will ask me, can't I just stick that board on my foam and kind of poke a marker through it? And I, I understand the temptation and we'd be close, this isn't too bad, but we do have a tiny margin of error on each step and it's entirely possible that my drill bit could have slipped or angled off or done something else that would lead to that method not being as true as I would like. So I don't want to multiply on any small margin of error that may have been present in my last step. I would rather go back and start again. I have the math, so it shouldn't be a problem to repeat my process from before. But remember now, I'm working on a piece of foam that is bigger than my board, and that's okay because I'm gonna work from the centers out, not from any of the edges, so I should be able to just apply the exact same process. So I have 20, halfway is 10, and 10. Okay, so once I have my centers marked, and I'm actually gonna change colors just so I can 
keep track of where my centers were, then I can just mark my spacing out. Remember this was four and a half, so I'm going two and a quarters. Two and a quarter, four and a half, six and three quarters, and nine. And I'll have a little more space on the edge because I have the extra half inch. And if I have any um, intolerance in my foam cutting, because I did use a foam saw, but I cut it by hand, so it's entirely plausible that it will have minor imperfections. It's at the edge um, and my math is still gonna stay really true across the entirety of my tufting layout. That's my vertical, so let's come back in here and do our horizontal lines. So that is six and a quarter, and three and one eighth. Come down here, same thing, three and a quarter, nope, three and an eighth, and a six and a quarter. So that grid should match exactly the one that we drew on our board. Now I just need to come back in here and repeat to identify which intersections are actually gonna receive the buttons. So I could conceivably take this same layout and, and flip it, right? Have my odd row on top if I decided that that was my preference. Excellent. This will appeal to all the woodworkers and architects who are, who are taking this class. Lots of math to it. Now, to get our holes in here, because those beautiful diamonds that we see, the reason they happen is because we are pulling our fabric down through the padding layers. So we need to clear this out, and I have another tool to introduce you to. So this is a cutter, um, I believe it's listed as a foam or fabric cutter. It has a smooth, sharp edge. We don't want something serrated because that can tear up our foam. So we're looking for something smooth like this. And this one happens to be a 22. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it correlates to the button size that we plan to use. So this is specifically made for this purpose. And I'm gonna attach it right into a drill. Now I'm only gonna do one here to show you because guess what, you should absolutely not be doing this on your nice cutting table or any other surface that you care about. Uh, take it over to a mess area or lay it on another piece of scrap foam is really smart because you can go through this and you can end up cutting whatever's underneath there. But I do want to demonstrate to you just one of these, what that looks like before I take this off camera. The first thing I wanna do is spray with silicone because this will love to grab on the foam and tear it or jerk my arm a bit. So on a spray, pretty generously along that edge. And a word to the wise, if you get that silicone all over the floor, you're gonna have a slippy spot, so uh, watch out. And I can just center that right over my hole and gently go through till I hit bottom and it should come out just a little foam plug like that. And I was very careful, so I don't think we damaged our, um, look at that, see? Shame on me. I have a little button mark on my, on my cutting table that serves me right. So that's why you don't do this here, okay? But I want you to see how that, that works. Now I'm gonna take this over to a mess area and I'm gonna go ahead and drill out all these holes just like I did on the wood. As you can see, I have finished drilling all the holes into my foam so that my buttons can be drawn all the way down into the board and create that distinctive pleat we're after. The other place that I want to clear away padding is going to be along the edges where I'll have folds coming out to the sides of the board. My favorite way to do that 
is just with a razor blade. You obviously want to be real careful with those. You can use this, you can use a utility knife. My lines are already marked, so the idea is just to come in and drag just about a half inch deep cut into the foam. And that will open up and that will let me drop a pleat really snugly in there later when I have fabric on. So I'll zip my way all the way around. Now did you see I skipped this one because that is, I only need my outer more buttons. That's where I'll have a pleat. This button will pleat into these buttons and these buttons will pleat out to the edge. So I'll come along the top, same thing. And look, can you see my original marks were centered perfectly on the grid and when that bit spins, it travels just a little bit sometimes. And that's okay, we can work with that margin of error, but that's why we're a little careful about assuming that everything we marked stays as perfect as we intended. A lot of cases in upholstery, it's, it's better to just assume that you're working with a certain tolerance and do the best we can to eliminate it but there's always going to be just a little bit of it there. Okay, let me check. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, all the way around. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to flip this over and I'm going to glue my board to the other side. I always like to glue it to the bottom because just like my bit can travel a little bit, it can also angle a little bit. So there's a good chance that the top of my foam is a little more accurate than the bottom of my foam. Hopefully they're all really within the tolerance we need. So I have a half inch showing all the way around. I'm just going to tip this up and glue it. I get in here come take a peek down in with me we should be able to see a buttonhole down in each of these but you can see some of them aren't as centered as you might expect even though I know that I marked my foam and my board the same and that really is just we attribute that to the little bit of tolerance that we get every time we drill but this is really going to work out nice if you don't see your holes at all then you're in trouble because you're not going to get a button needle through solid wood. The last layer we want here before fabric is that polyester batting. This is going to give everything a little bit of loft and also just a, just a little bit of forgiveness for anything that I had to hand cut that's going to clean it up really nice. So I'm going to lightly glue the top and I'll wrap it around the edges as well and we'll get a look at it when that's all in place and talk about what we need to do to prepare this layer for tufting. Ended with that batting. I've completely wrapped the top of my project and I've glued it around all the edges and then trimmed off the extra. In case you haven't noticed yet, I'm not a huge fan of stapling that batting around to the back side. I'm not going to say never do it, but it definitely runs the risk of us ending up with a lot of material piled on the back because we still have fabric coming and we're going to be pleating those corners. And so if we start layering up product on that back edge, we may regret it later on. So this is just lightly tacked. It's going to stay put for now. If I need to trim or modify it as I work, I certainly can, but this is a good place to start. Now I have covered up all my buttonholes. So when I come in here and I'm trying to pull my fabric down in there, I can't do it if there's batting in the way. So I need to come in here and I need to open up each of those buttonholes. I'm using one of my gluey pairs of scissors. It's nice to have one dedicated pair that you use 
over on your mess table. I have to be a little bit of a psychic here because it's not the easiest to see where your holes are at, but we remember because we made it. Ah, now, now my buttons can get down in there. Good. All right, those are all cleared. I also need to come around and reopen my side slits. I'm gonna just run my scissors right into the line I opened up in the fold. are opened up as you can see tufting really is a lot of prep to make sure that everything is on target for that finished product but if that's done well that should really set us up for success all right so a lot of prep to get to the point where we get to talk about fabric but all our buttonholes are opened up all our edge slits are opened up and hopefully everything is on track for that end result that we are anticipating now we get to start to talk about how should we be cutting our fabric for this? And we'll give you a relatively simple formula. If this was a slip seat, what would I do? I'd measure up and around where I'm planning to staple to where I'm planning to staple. So maybe I get about 31. To that I would add my handles, 33, 35. But remember now, my fabric needs to travel in and out of each of these buttonholes. How much is that gonna take? The formula we've used that has not let me down yet in many, many, many years of using it is that we are going to add the thickness of the foam times the number of buttonholes across the widest point. So my wide row, not my bottom row, my wide row has 10, okay? So that is two, four, six, eight, 10, plus the 35 that we came up with for over the top plus my handles, which means we need 45 inch width to tuft out our 20, what is this? How big is our sample? Our sample board is 23 inches. So we just went from 23 to 45. Let's do that one more time, okay? If this was a slip seat, I would go from where I plan to staple all the way over the top to where I plan to staple, and that gives me 31. To that I want to add my 4 inch handles, because 2 inch on each side, so 31 becomes 33, becomes 35, and then in order to tuft it 5 times, I need to add two, four, six, eight, ten inches of fabric. So my 35 becomes 45. So my width this way is 45. Let's do it this way. Let me go from where I plan to staple to where I plan to staple. It gives me 27. 27 plus handles becomes 29, 31, plus, where's my longest row? Two, four, six inches, 31 becomes 37. So I need to go cut my fabric 37 inches long by 45 inches wide. Using those formulas, you should be able to figure yardage for just about any simple tufted project, but go pull up a magazine picture of something like a queen or a king size headboard, something that's got loads of rows this way and loads of rows that way, and see if you can figure out how much fabric it actually takes, because it will catch your client off guard, but if you know what it actually takes, then you can estimate accordingly. Let's go get some fabric. All right, I think that you have watched us cut enough fabric to understand what, what happens there. So I have gone ahead and cut my piece of fabric the size we discussed. I made sure to square my fabric up first. I have centered 
or I've notched my centers top and bottom and I have labeled uh, my bottom edge backside. So I'm gonna flip this over and let's talk a little bit about how we're gonna get started working this onto our sample board because tufting may finish looking like it's all neat and tidy, but I promise you it does not feel or look that way when you are working on it, trying to wrestle this piece of fabric into all those tucks. Our end goal, our end goal is really a piece of fabric that travels squarely down from top to bottom and from side to side. And what can happen is that as buttons are going in, that fabric is sort of walking um, in different directions. And what can happen, we'll talk about this more as we tuft, as you get down here, if you, if you started with erratic spacing or um, a crooked top row of buttons, is that you might get away with it here and you might get away with it here. But by the time you start getting to that third and fourth and fifth row, all of a sudden you don't have any fabric to pleat over here and you have way more than you can make work over here because you have, um, you have unevenly distributed the fabric across your tufting. So what I like is to make sure that we start with enough guidelines to give ourselves a little bit of checks and balances. So first I am going to mark my center line and this fabric I'm working with sure does like to walk around. So I'm checking my grain. Then I can give myself a line. Now, if you're working on a super light fabric, you obviously wanna be a little mindful of what you're marking on the back that could peek through. I want you guys to be able to see this. And then I wanna mark out my top row of buttons because if those start in the right spot, the rest of my sample will probably follow, but if that first row is off, I will probably not recover. So I'm gonna mark a line 10 inches down. And what that 10 inches is, is going over to my sample board and figuring out where that top row of buttons is likely to be placed. So I'm gonna do that with a tape measure where I would staple to the first row of buttons plus my handle on top and an inch to go down into the buttonhole. Oops, I marked that one wrong. Thought that looked off. Okay, 10 inches down. Let me strike that across. Again, go lightly if you're on a light fabric. But we want you to see. All right. Now, how far apart should my buttons be placed? Do you remember that math we used? We added two inches per buttonhole, and I'm just going to spread that out. So if my buttons were marked four and a half inches apart, I'm gonna add in my two inches, five and a half, six and a half. So on my fabric, they should be marked six and a half inches apart. I don't have one in the middle, so I can center my ruler and my first buttons are going to be three and a quarter inches out from there. Let me talk through that again. On my sample board, my buttonholes are four and a half inches apart. I've added on two inches per buttonhole to get us up and over the foam, which is the thickness of my foam, right? Four and a half plus my two inch foam brings us to six and a half. So on my fabric, my buttons are going to be marked six and a half inches apart. And on that top row, I don't have a button in the center. So three and a quarter is right on my midline, right there. And then my center buttons are three and a quarter inches off of there. That was word salad, huh? Did you follow that? Check, check for your, um, and look at your, look at your course materials too, because everything that I'm telling you now is also explained in there. And math, you know, it's just a lot easier sometimes to see it than it is to listen to it. Okay, but look at that. That's my first four buttons. 
that I can now position with confidence, knowing that I'm maintaining a straight line, knowing that I'm maintaining an appropriate and even distance between buttons. If I eyeballed those first four, I guarantee I would not end up here. I would probably end up with one that was a little more, one that was a little less, one that was walked up at an angle, and then it's, then it's trouble. Okay, I wanna make sure that I start straight here. Now, you may be wondering, can't we just go out and mark all the buttons? We maybe could. We maybe could, and if I was gonna do a whole series of tufted panels, I probably would. I would make sure the math worked, and I would mark out every single button so I could just stand there all day long and put my buttons in. However, this is not set in stone. My perfect dimension might not be six and a half. Maybe it's six and three quarters. Maybe it's six and one quarter. Uh, we have to allow for some of that. That is the custom nature of this. And I'm only gonna do this project once. You guys know I've done it a few times, but if I'm only gonna do it once, it makes sense to just get myself started and then I'm gonna do the rest by hand. And I do want you to develop those skills, to know how to fold it in and do it by feel, but know that marking it out is certainly an option and sometimes you wanna execute that option. There are other times when it just isn't practical. Maybe you're working around some variables, maybe you're working on a, on a curved back for something, um, but I want you to know how to do that tufting by hand as well. So uh, let's get our board over here and we are gonna start tufting this sampler. We have our fabric with our first row of buttons marked. Now let's introduce a few extra tools we're gonna be adding. So I have my buttons all made. We're using a 22 because that is the size cutter that we used on the foam. I have a button needle, just choose a length that you're comfortable with. And then I have a button twine, and that's going to be nice and strong for pulling our buttons into this sample. I like just about a yard each for this. As you guys learned, my mom taught me that, like a, what you call it, like a tailor's yard or something like that, kind of shoulder to fingertips. This is not critical. Maybe I'll just cut off for now for our first four buttons. And I have a, a scrap of cotton, not Dacron, cotton, synthetic or natural is fine, but we'll use this to temporarily anchor our buttons so we can reposition them. If that doesn't make sense, I promise it will. Okay, let's get these first buttons in. I'm gonna grab my piece of twine and thread one of my wire eye buttons. I'll take both ends now, my button hanging off of it, and take that through the eye of my button needle. Now these first four are marked, so it's not critical, but usually we're gonna start towards the center. Now that's always, always kind of our, our rule of thumb. So I went right through my button mark and down through the corresponding spot in my foam and my board. Okay, let's pull this through. Are my buttons floating up in there, but what I really want to do is pull it all the way down into that little tunnel that we cleared. Look at that, so you can already see the reason we have a diamond pattern is because that fabric has to fold when we have pulled it down into the padding. So let's secure this. Now we may end up having to move buttons around, so we're not gonna get ahead of ourselves. I wanna put a temporary knot here, so I'm gonna use a slip knot. Okay, I have both strings in my left hand. I'm gonna take the string on the right, go under my pointer and over my strings under my strings and down through my finger loop. So now I have a knot I can slide and I'm gonna put just a little clump of cotton in here to keep my knot from going through the board. I'll show you one more like that. There we go. One down, only 21 buttons to go. Let's repeat that whole process. 
So I'm gonna take my string, string my button, take both my ends with the button hanging off, and take that through the needle. So now I'll come get my other center button, flip it back so I can find my mark. And then down into the correlating hole. If I can find it, there it is. See what I mean about to get in here, it can be really hard <laughs> to tell if you're straight or not. Very disorienting when all that fabric is bunched and gathered. But we can proceed with confidence because we marked the first four while our fabric was flat on the table. Oh, you know what? I wanna show you that knot one more time, you ready? I had to see this one lots of times before I could remember it. My string's in my left hand. I'm gonna take the string on the right, under my pointer, over my strings, under my strings, and down through my finger loop. There's probably like really great ways to remember that. I don't know, that involve, you know, like someone diving down a hole or, whatever all those tricks are that we learn when we're tying our shoes, but I don't know them. Okay, that's in. Let's turn around and see. So far, so good, and I'm not even gonna judge my work right now. I am trusting my math. I am trusting my past self and the work that I did with a ruler. So I will go forth with confidence. Let's find these outside buttons. There we go. Through the mark on my fabric, down into my foam, and then my board. Let's make sure that our button finds its way down in. Isn't this gonna be fun? We're gonna get such a workout. Yes. Here we go again, tying that slip knot under, over, under, and through. This is why you keep a, keep a little bag or bin of scrap cotton in your shop. Just a little one, you guys. You don't need a dumpster full. Good, one more. Very good, one row down. All right, with our first row in, we have switched to a different angle that I hope will be helpful for you in seeing what we're about now. Because once you get that first row in, it can feel, be overwhelming to feel like what is even going on here with all that twisting and all that bunching, how on earth am I supposed to know where the heck these buttons go? But if you can remember that end result and what we're really after, that very mathematical and symmetrical positioning, very neat of all these buttons, we can start to pick them off one at a time. So my first row is straight. I have even spacing, I have assured that. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna start thinking about my second row and I'll start in the center. And you can see what I'm doing here. I'm kind of training my fabric into the pleats that will point into my next button and I'm just gonna tuck that with my finger. What I'm looking for here, I hope, can you see that my fabric has a very 
chunky, visible grain. And I did that intentionally. And I love for our students to do that too when they're learning to tuft because I can use that as a visual guide to go, okay, if I find the center here and I follow it down, that really should point me directly to my next button. And how tight do I wanna go here? It's certainly possible to be too loose. It is possible to be too snug. Personally, I think it's very easy to over pull, but you'll, you'll see what your own habits are uh, with, with time and practice. But we do want that fabric to rise up to the full two inch height of our foam and back down. We're not trying to flatten that out and put a big crease between our buttons. So when I'm, when I'm kind of basting this, into place, that's what I'm looking for, that I, that I still have my full height in the center and that my grain is directly down. Now in the center, I can also use my pencil line on the back to make sure that I am actually on my center line. And if this is straight across the top and I stay straight down the middle, I shouldn't be able to get into too much mischief in the buttons that are remaining. Let me check, yep, that looks good. And we'll go ahead and get a button in here. Let's see how we did. Get some of my mess out of the way and pull it down in. And I think that looks pretty darn good. And remember, I'm not looking at any of this, but I am looking, are we straight down from center and does that seem like the appropriate amount of, of tension across the center of my diamond? And I think, I think that that feels good. So I'm going to tie it off and go on to the next one. Okay, I'll work my way out from there. And now I have two dimensions to consider. I can look at the center point between my buttons and follow that down. And I can also eyeball a straight line from my center button out to its neighbor. All of those lines should theoretically be staying straight. That will keep my spacing even. That will keep my pleats uniform. It is certainly not as simple as that, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun and feeling your way through that process and getting a sense of what it feels like when it is correct and what it feels like when you have started to wander. Okay, so hold that with my finger take a visual inventory. So that looks centered here. Does this look in alignment here? Looks like about the right amount of fullness and I have dressed my pleats, gently dressed my pleats into their diagonal position. So go again, now this, there's nothing for me to check on the back because remember now, now we have nothing marked and we're going by what we can see, what our eyes and our hands tell us. That looks pretty promising. I like the height. Things look reasonably straight. Well, one of the cruelties of tufting is that if one of these buttons is off, and it's possible. I'll get away with it in this row and the next row, but it'll probably be the row after that when I start to discover that something is up, that I have a fabric shortage or a fabric, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, too much, a surplus in one of my pleats. And usually if that happens to you, you can't just pull out that one button. You have to work your way back a couple rows to figure out where you started to wander. So it does take a couple rows to multiply. All right, let's go over here and we're gonna try this again. 
same thing, one button at a time. This is why we charge per button because each of these has to be set by hand. And it is, it's time consuming, but I hope that you will find it uh, meditative instead of tedious. Very satisfying to see those, see those results start to, start to appear. Okay. And I want to introduce one more tool here because as you can see, I've really been using my fingers. I am, I am just more of a, I'm kind of a handsy person when I talked and I'll just get my, get my digits in there to wrestle. But if you are struggling with that, there's a lot of people who really like to use this as a regulator. There's a couple other flat ended tools that are popular for getting in here and really tucking your pleats, especially down near the button where it can be hard to get, get your fingers in to the fabric. Let me take a peek. And I think, I think that that looks pretty good. I'm gonna check my visual, I'm gonna, I'm gonna visually check my grain coming down from here. Make sure that that seems straight. I'm gonna check from my side button into this button, that looks good. And the fullness looks about right to me. That gives me three sort of honesty checks to hopefully stay on track. Ooh, I think that's looking pretty nice. Let's get that over. Now I have an anecdote, you guys maybe know that I started learning upholstery with my mom as a kid and then uh, in my early adulthood. And my training tended to follow the schedule of when she was available. That's how that works when you work in a shop, even if it's your mom's. Um, and so if she was gone, I would just work on what I knew how to do until she came back and could show me something else. But one time she was gone and I was looking around for something to do and I called her up and I said, so tell me about this diamond tufting thing. What? could I do that might wreck it? Is there anything I could do that we can't undo? And she said, no, not really. I mean, put the buttons in and if it doesn't look right, take them back out. So that's what I did and it was a lot of fun and um, it turned out fine, but I want you to remember that, that like, don't be intimidated by this because if you're using a fabric and for heaven's sakes, I hope you are when you are learning, we could, we could really, I could take buttons in and out of this almost indefinitely, possibly even indefinitely. So even though it's maybe not our favorite thing in the whole world to rework, tufting is way more forgiving than you might think at a glance. Okay, now when I come out to the side, this is gonna be a little bit, a little bit tricky because I don't have any tension over here to guide me. So I really have to be watching this. And I have to imagine, okay, this is gonna get tensioned over here, but I should just be able to look at my straight grain here and the amount of tension I'm applying and get my nice pleat from the top row. Yeah, let's drop a button in there and see what happens. We're not gonna wreck anything. One more and my second row will be done, hopefully for good. Hopefully we will not be back to visit. All right, let's talk about the next row. So now into our third row and this is where we'll finally see that full diamond start to appear. I'm gonna follow the same sort of logic that I used on the last row, just to kind of hand fold hand train my pleats in and use the grain of my fabric as a visual reference to follow down. And you will see, you know, this is not gonna stay perfectly straight for me, um, which is something to consider if you have a client come along who wants to put a plaid on a tufted thing. It certainly can be done. It's definitely not for everyone because uh, tufting has a certain look to it and it, it pulls in a lot of dimensions and curves and angles. So, all right, but never mind about that. 
Let's work with our solid. And I'm gonna follow that same procedure to try to follow, make sure I'm coming straight down into my next button. Make sure that I'm allowing a full rise of the fabric over my padding and that my pleats are setting nice. Now let's talk about these pleats. When I, when I first learned to tuft, I thought, well, those pleats should all face inward. That made logical sense to me that our diamond should sort of like, you know, be a diamond. But actually, we want all those pleats facing the same direction. So look at this. Like I'm tucking up into my pleat, and in the next row, I'm tucking up into my pleat. And there's a couple good reasons for this. One is if this was a headboard and it was actually vertical against a wall, we wouldn't want any dust or hair or anything settling into kind of the lip of that fold. So we want our folds facing down. So if this was a headboard, this would be my top, this would be my bottom, and all my pleats would be facing down. It's also going to ensure that the light is catching each angle consistently so that, so that the shadows so that the shadows are visually consistent. So that, that confused me as a young professional, but uh, I've been convinced. All right, let's get this in here. I can see that start to take shape. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe just coax my folds a little bit differently. And let's see how we feel. Yeah, I think that looks all right. I'm gonna flip it. Now, if you can do this without flipping your project over, tufting makes a very, very, very satisfying time lapse. Very engaging. Okay. Let's go on over to the other side of center. Left, right, left, right. And again, here we go that I have a couple dimensions to check. I'm gonna follow down from, I remember my first button, we marked on the table, so we know that one's right. Anything else that looks goofy, I'm gonna question, but I'm not apt to question that first button. Yep, I think that looks good, and I'm gonna look for the rise here, and the rise here, and the line, staying straight. Can use my regulator, to assist any pleats that don't want to play nice. Very nice, we can start to see our diamond pattern come together. I have two rows left and the process is going to be very much the same, but it will tell me how I've done so far in these rows. If everything has stayed relatively true, my last two rows should be almost assured. Um, and if I got off someplace, then I may run into a little bit of trouble, but hopefully everything goes swimmingly. I'm going to wrap up these last two rows and then we'll talk about edge pleats. But this is a really wonderful place to put on your favorite album or get a good audiobook and just lose yourself in the process of diamond tufting. All 
right, so we got all of our rows of buttons in. You guys might notice a little bit of a change of scenery. We ran out of phone storage, so we decided to rearrange the workroom in the meantime. But now we're good to go again. And with all our buttons in, the next thing that we want to do is actually get these permanently anchored. You know, permanent being a, being a loose term, of course, but right now these just have that slip knot in there. So they are still semi-mobile, which is obviously not a good thing um, once this project goes out the door. Uh, now, if I was working inside of a piece of furniture, I could just go ahead and square knot this, which means an overhand knot right over left and an overhand knot left over right. Maybe even wanna do that a couple times, but that would lock it up. However, if I'm working on something like a headboard or a bench that needs to lay more or less flat, I really don't want these big tufts of, of cotton in here. So then it makes sense for me to and I grip my button. You know what, let me go to one that I didn't knot off here and see if I can get some clearance to slide that tuft out, okay? I could even restring the button, but if I can get the cotton out, I'm just fine. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna staple that to the back of my board. It's pulled all the way in. And I always like to do a little ziggy zaggy so that it's not going to slide. Then I can trim my ends. Let's do another one. I'm gonna pull on this so that I can get some clearance and try and slide my button, uh, my, uh, excuse me, all this cotton out. And if you're really confident and you knew for sure where all your buttons were gonna go, I actually could have stapled these first, but I think it's nice when you're learning tufting or if you just think things might move around uh, to use that temporary knot. Okay, my cotton is out. And my button twine is stapled. I'm gonna zip around here and get the rest of these and then we will talk about how to finish all our edge pleats and our corners. I like to start by anchoring the center because I really know more or less where that should be. Let me get one staple in here and then I'm going to uh, show you what we're looking at. Just one. So I do want to follow my fabric straight up and just place a staple in the center. I also don't want to yank it all the way down. I want to leave fullness just like I have going between my buttons so that I can, I can kind of maintain that rhythm all the way out to the edges of my board. Now let me go around and get a couple more of those centers in. And I am gonna go ahead and we'll do the corners last but to do this pleat, I need to have both these uh, at least basted into position. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put a staple there and a staple on my other end one. Now this is gonna take me some time to work all these in. So what I wanna do is really sample for you just a couple, just a couple of how we're going to do. But um, from here on out, this is really already anchored. There's nothing I can do on this edge that's really gonna disturb that edge. So we, we can really work with it in any order now. I can do this, I can, I can baste all my centers, I can start on the short sides, the long sides. We're kind of golden from here. Now we just gotta keep putzing. But I do wanna look at all these pleats. Now if this was, if this was, there we go, that is the direction this goes. If this was my top and bottom, and I have all my pleats so that they're facing down so they don't collect dust and hair, I would continue that pattern on the sides, and I will. But up top, I am just going to elect to face them all right or to face them all left. 
for consistency's sake, but we don't have really an incorrect way to do that. We just like, we like consistency. So let's see, I guess I'm gonna go, this one wants to go that way, this one wants to go that way, this one wants to go. These are fiddly, they really wanna go any which way they feel like. So let me get in here. There we go. So I'm gonna flip these. So they're all facing the same direction. If you prefer to work with a regulator, you can. See, and I just flipped that one completely the wrong way. So it happens when you're talking and doing sometimes. That one's gonna be a stinker. There we go. Okay. And I am tucking it down into that slit that I created. So you can see that's really why we need that slit so that this is gonna sit in nice down to the edge of my fabric. So now when I get up here with the centers anchored, I really should be able to just work my two layers together. Now I like to, I like to kind of drop my bottom layer in. And then work my top layer over. And you can experiment with, um, you know, I have, I have friends and colleagues who like to get in there and really trim fabric out and, and find their own way to sort of make everything look right. Um, but this is sort of, if it looks good, it is good territory. So experiment. And I'm just gonna show you the way I would normally do it. All right, so here we're gonna repeat that again. Okay, we got the first side. I put my bottom under and folded my top over. I'm gonna do that again. And see, there's my center staple just hanging out there. My bottom goes down and my top comes over. Maybe. I'm gonna tip this down in a second and show you how things are looking on the other side. But I love this angle because I can actually be checking how this is looking. You know, is this, is this where I want it? Am I maintaining that fullness? Am I getting any weird pulls in there? Hopefully not. Let's do one more. So my bottom layer goes under. Don't be afraid to get a little rough with it. We can't be shy, and my top goes over. That looks pretty good. But still here, you know, our ability to rework is almost indefinite. So you don't have to stress too much about anything that you might have to redo, but look at that, there we go. So we're looking for straight pleats, we're looking for even fullness between, we're looking for consistency of direction. Now I'm gonna do one, I'm gonna do one more, let me get you out to the edge here. Mm, watching my fullness, I really wanna, wanna over yank that one. Fold this on top. I was trying to get a little crooked on me to watch myself. Okay, now I could reposition that one because I think it's probably a little bit loose, but the very last thing I'm gonna finish is my corners. So I'm not even gonna worry about that. I'm just gonna let it let it ride and I will revisit it when we finish when we finish all the corners. So I'm gonna go around and repeat that on all my edges and then we will talk about wrapping up the corners and trimming everything down. All of our side pleats are in except for just our corners. It looks pretty good. Uh, tufting, the nice thing is that you can rework it almost indefinitely, but the tough thing is that you can rework it almost indefinitely. So I will leave it for each of you to decide when you feel like it is done, done, done. I am gonna move on to 
each of my corners now. Um, so I have it anchored about to here and about to here. And what I'm gonna do is finish off my side and then fold in my top. Let me flip this up and I'm gonna finish this side off. And I'm watching the curve of my fabric because I will swing that down. I want a little tension into the corner so that I can get a neat fold. See that? So I'm gonna drop, can see my grain, drop into that corner. But if I come straight across, I'm gonna have a big mushy corner and nobody likes that. So I'm gonna swing that down. And out go my staples to the edge. Oh, I got a very sticky pair of scissors out of the bin today. Okay, let me trim that. Now I have all this extra and just like on my slip seats, I'm going to trim a bunch of that off so that I can get everything in neat and tidy. I like to kind of start with, if I just fold this, it's very hard to get all the, all the underneath layers to behave. So I like to put sort of a halfway pleat in there and I'm trying to get, just trying to get some tension along that edge. I'm trying to make sure that my corner is gonna pull in nice. A little pleat or a little staple for that. Okay, <laughs> I was having so much fun doing, I wasn't talking. Okay, so that's, that's in, I tuck my layer, and now I just get to fiddle. I'm gonna try and get as neat and crisp a pleat as I can. And get, oh, well, that doesn't really look so good, does it? I gotta trim some more out of there, gross. Oh, isn't this scary, trimming your last corner after you've spent so long tufting your sampler? But don't worry, it's just a board. Nobody's going to die. It's going to be okay. Here we go. How's that? How does that look from the front? The corner pleats are always just such a stinker on tufting. So play around with them um, until you have something that you like. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna let that ride. But pull it out as many times as you want until you're happy with it. Let me trim it and we'll take a look at it from the front. The world's snuggest scissors. I'm gonna go find a new pair of those, I tell you what. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now I just have to try and make all the others the same. I hope we have convinced you that this process is more accessible than it might appear. What is wonderful, however, is that diamond tufting never fails to impress people who know very little about upholstery. This means your clients, your friends, your family. So go ahead, put some tufting up on your social media or wherever else you are sharing your work because people are sure to ooh and ah. Take all that information that we gave you, see where else you can break down that process and start to create diamond tufting layouts of your own.